Okay, um, good morning, friends, colleagues, and guests. Welcome back. For those of you who did not manage to join us last night, um, welcome to the Asia Journalism Forum. The forum is funded by Temasek Foundation Connects and it's part of a three-month Asia Journalism Fellowship. So be before we begin the program, um, we would just like to remind you of a few media guidelines. Number one, the panel sessions today are all open for media coverage and we have some friends from the media here with us at the end of the room. The panel sessions will also be live streamed on the IPS Facebook page, so please share the stream with your friends and colleagues who are not here with us today. Now, on the screen behind me, you should see our Twitter, yes you do, our Twitter handle and the hashtag for the forum, so please you know, help us spread the message and tweet about the event. So the panel sessions will all be recorded and subsequently uploaded to the IPS YouTube page. We would like to now invite the director of the Institute of Policy Studies, Mr. Janadas Devan, to give his opening remarks, following which uh, Mr. Benedict Cheong, the Chief Executive Officer of Tomasic Foundation International, will give his welcome remarks. Please join me in welcoming Janadas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, contrary to propaganda, the trains don't always run on time in Singapore. Um, so I understand the north-south line and north, west or north, south? North, south and the downtown lines are, um, have been disrupted. I think they've resumed operations, but lots of people are late. Um, so still waiting for people to come. Um, let me just say a few remarks, um, make a few remarks. Um, the, this fellowship program was begun about 10 years ago, um, and it was based in the Week in Week School. Um, the founders of the program and the people who built it up, um, including Cherry and George and my colleague uh, Alan John, are still here with us uh, 10 years later, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, last year, or rather this year, um, the program was transferred to the Institute of Policy Studies. Um, um, we will um, run it for the, another three years or so, at least. Um, and um, for a number of reasons, it was a natural fit, and we agreed uh, to host it. Um, IPS um, has um, had a focus on media studies for a very long time, uh, since its inception, partly because of um, the people um, who were in IPS, um, with um, most of all Arun Mahidnan, who was also associated uh, with um, the Asian Journalism Fellowship Program. Um, and uh, it seemed natural that uh, we should um, um, uh, host this program. And um, uh, one of uh, IPS role is, in fact, uh, to provide a platform for various groups uh, to gather. Um, and um, uh, we have done this on the domestic front, and um, we've done some of it on the international front, and so it was a natural fit. Um, we're very happy to host this, uh, and I'm very happy that Alan John um, is still very much of the part of the program. So part of um, the reason why we were able to host this thing is because he agreed uh, to continue. Um, the, this year um, is also the 10th anniversary of the program. So in September or so, um, there will be a 10th anniversary gathering of um, all the alumni, or as many of the alumni associated with the Asian Journalism Fellowship as possible. Um, some of you may know that uh, I wear another hat. I'm also the Chief of Government Communications. Uh, Singapore, many of us wear a number of hats. I think you met um, uh, Mr. Chi Hong Tat yesterday, who was minister, Senior Minister of State in Health as well as in Communications and Information. Um, and um, we are right now um, in the process of planning for um, or preparing for what's called the National Day Rally. Every year the Prime Minister addresses the whole nation. It's something like the State of the Union. Um, only he addresses um, uh, 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 not the legislature but, uh, but an audience. And um, the National Day Rally um, has um, occurred, this, this institution has become an institution, has occurred every year uh, since 1966, the first anniversary of Singapore's independence. And, um, and it's grown. Um, it's quite a huge um, enterprise, uh, um, takes many months of preparation. Um, but when we began in the 1960s, 1970s, um, National Day Rally, the government would, you will have an audience of about 80% of um, 
the viewing public. Tele it's televised. Um, it used to get about 80%, or perhaps even more. Um, and because in those days, there, was, there were only two channels, um, one English channel and one channel devoted to, uh, to the vernacular languages, Chinese, Malay, Tamil. And um, there was nothing but this on both channels. So when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew addressed a National Day rally, um, you could only have, you had only two channels and he was on on both channels. Now, despite the intensity of preparation, which is actually much more intense than it used to be, we never reach beyond 30%. I think we hit 35% in 2015, which was the 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence. Now you're lucky if you breach 30%. Last year, the Prime Minister fainted on stage and we did not breach 30%. <laughs> so this is a problem um, the, the, that we all have to face. It has got economic consequences. It has political consequences. Um, the media landscape has become fractured. We used to call the media mass media, uh, broadcasting media. Um, there still is mass media. Uh, there are still television stations, newspapers that reach large numbers of people, but it has become a good deal less mass. Um, it used to be called broadcasting because, you know, you cast the net and it was caught a broad, broad spectrum of the population. Um, but it's increasingly becoming less broad. Um, and this has consequences. Um, it does mean, among other things, that an entire population or a large number of people are not all having the same conversation. Um, in America, for example, in, you know, huge big events like the assassination of Kennedy, 1963 happened, or the moon landing, or you know, the Columbia disasters of various kinds, um, Columbia Space Shuttle, 9-11. Um, um, on occasions like this, and on a daily basis, you had large numbers of people all watching more or less the same programs on television. And so people shared the same set of facts, the same set of um, assumptions. You had different views, but at least they possessed the same set of facts. Um, there's an American senator uh, by the name of Daniel Patrick Moynihan who famously used to say, everyone is entitled to his own opinions. What you're not entitled to are your own facts. And increasingly, because of the fractured media in America, it's, it's, it's also reflected elsewhere to a large degree, also in Singapore. Increasingly, different segments of the population are possess what to them seem to be different facts. They live in different universes. I read in the papers today, uh, Chari and George talking about climate change, for example. And despite all the scientific evidence, and despite the consensus of scientists um, on climate change, there's a sizable number of people in America who don't believe that climate change exists or that it is real. A sizable number of people who don't believe evolution is real. So you belong to different, you, you are you are convinced by different facts, with different worldviews, and as a result, um, there is no possibility or very little possibility of a meeting on common ground. And a fractured media makes this conversation um, that extends beyond politics. Um, you know, even climate change is just one example. Um, to, to have a conversation with each other. And this is a challenge that as journalists, as um, communicators in government or elsewhere, or as citizens we are increasingly faced with. It's a challenge that is not easy to resolve. Um, and um, um, we, we just, you know, this is the new dispensation. Um, and uh, and, and the, the, the economic consequences of a disrupted media landscape, it becomes more difficult for newspapers and uh, businesses in the me mass media or media to survive. And uh, they are, they are, they are, um, the business model has been disrupted and uh, we have no clear sight of, a, of, a, of another business model that might work. Um, this conference will take place, uh, will complete today. It's a one and a half day conference. 
and the program uh, will last uh, for about eight weeks. Uh, how many weeks? 12 weeks, okay. Um, and um, you will have uh, many opportunities uh, to meet both Singaporeans as well as um, um, uh, government officials, academics, um, and ordinary citizens. I hope you have a fr fruitful time, and I hope to carry on this conversation on other occasions. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished uh, speakers and delegates here and friends, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, on behalf of the family of the Massive Foundations, I welcome you to this conference. Uh, if you allow me, this is the commercial part of the, the, the program, so if you allow me, please uh, let me share a little bit about the genesis of this program and uh, the Massive Foundation. Uh, Tomase, you know, uh, many of you know the name of Tomase. Some, it has a presence, some of you in your countries and communities, Tomase has a presence in investment. So Tomase is an investment company uh, which focuses on just returns and investments. Because Tomase made uh, decent returns uh, from Asia in the 90, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, they decided to contribute to Asia, but not to charity, but to capacity building, to institution building, and to promote learning and exchange. So this program has come about because we felt that it would be nice to provide a platform for uh, journalists to get together, journalists such as all of you, editors, sub-editors, to get together to exchange ideas. Now, uh, there are several firsts this year about this program. As Janada said, this is the first year IPS, Institute of Policy Studies, uh, is leading it. And might I say, uh, we've been, it's been a pleasure working with them. Uh, the team has worked very hard. Uh, Carol, where are you? Somewhere? Oh, you're there? Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. They, she, she and her team have worked very hard to make this program uh, possible. As you know, uh, Janada was sharing with you, we have a 12, 8 to 12 week fellowship program. Uh, 16 fellows are here among you today. And within this fellowship program, we created uh, uh, this uh, two day, one and a half to two day forum. Um, all, all the brainchild of uh, someone who is very dear to us, uh, he was your keynote speaker last night at dinner. Now you know why. Um, he's been with this program for so long, and we, we really want to thank him, uh, Charin. And of course, Alan, uh, I want to echo Janadas' uh, gratitude uh, to, for you to take, to take on this mentor to continue this program. So uh, that's the first uh, of the first point I want to make. The second first uh, is that this is the first year we have two of the Tomasi Foundations sponsoring the whole program. Uh, Tomasi Found Foundation International, which I represent, uh, is supporting the, the, the eight to 12 week program for the fellows, and Tomasi Foundation Connects uh, is supporting this two-day forum. Uh, it's a complementary approach that we are taking, and hopefully uh, this can multiply the, the effect. Why this program? Why, why, why is Tomasi supporting such a program? As I share with you, uh, if we can bring together leaders, such as all of you here, to exchange ideas, perspectives, I think it will make for better understanding and trust all around, and hopefully uh, more cooperation, uh, more collaboration between communities and countries. Before I end, I want to share this story which I always share at the fellowship, and because this, year, this, this conference is very special because I really met the person who, about which the story is. And this is also the reason why this, this fellowship has gone on for 10 years. After the first run, uh, this journalist from India, a fellow, she spent three months here, she came up to me and she thanked me profusely for supporting the program. And I was a bit bashful, I was a bit shy because uh, it was Tamasi Foundation's money and not really my personal money. So, you know, all we did was to get the program together, find the resources. She said to me, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? And she said, for the past three months, I've spent a lot of nights. The, 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 the fellow residing next to me, in, uh, the, the, the fellows are housed in, in, in dormitories and rented apartments. So she said, the fellow residing next to me was a fellow from Pakistan. 
And for the last three months, we've spent so many evenings just talking, listening to each other over chai, over tea. And she said to me, why does it take for a program to be run in Singapore to bring together two of us from India and Pakistan? Uh, this story, unfortunately, has a slight, well, not slight, <laughs> it's a major tragic ending. Uh, the journalist from Pakistan was assassinated some years back in Karachi. But I'm given hope because last night when I met this Indian journalist, she said to me, you know, I'm still in touch with the wife of this Pakistani journalist and we still keep in touch. So this, to me, is the power of such gatherings, uh, such... Uh, sort of conferences, if you will, where people meet, learn from each other, exchange ideas, perspectives. As journalists, you have so much leverage, so much leeway to shape opinions. And if, you can, if we can bring together ideas and perspectives, perhaps we can bring the world, bring our communities closer together. And this must be uh, the vision of this program. And of course, uh, the thesis of what? the Tamasic Foundation family is all about. So I thank you for this short uh, intermission time uh, that you allowed me to share with you a bit, and I wish you a very fruitful day ahead. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome the chairperson and the three speakers for panel one to join us on stage. So the chair is um, Alan John. Uh, you have heard a lot about him. He's director of the Asia Journalism Fellowship. But if you have not heard about him, that means you have not read The Straits Times, where he has spent 35 years as a writer, editor, trainer, and mentor. So, Alan is also the author of two books with very sexy titles, and is currently working on a book with a team of social workers on domestic violence in Singapore. Please uh, welcome Alan and his three speakers. Can we have the other two speakers as well, Eric and Wahayu? Thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here ahead of me. Uh, Okay, um, it, it's been interesting uh, spending my life in journalism when we were, when I worked in a print newspaper and we had one deadline. And then uh, for the last 10 years, I've watched uh, this tsunami wa wash over our newsroom as things change and, and digital became the word uh, in our newsrooms and journalists had to work differently and life is completely different now. Um, in the last couple of years, people have, have begun asking what's the point of journalism when readers will believe almost anything, and they do, you know. Um, yesterday, we, uh, the, the AJF fellows spent the afternoon with uh, Senior Minister of State, Chi Hong Tat, and at one point somebody asked him, why is Singapore such an insecure and paranoid place? You know, and uh, basically he said, we, we don't really care if the rest of the world thinks that we are insecure and paranoid because essentially we are uh, and we are just small little space and uh, when it comes to fake news and, and things that will circulate and will get believed even though they are lies, uh, Singapore is going to make no excuses for dealing with this because in matters of race and religion it is critical in this small, compact uh, space that we live in. Uh, then last night, there was Charin over here, and only Charin will do this, because he, we asked him to talk about fake news, and he comes and he broadens our horizons on this whole thing, and he expands it all over the place, and we are talking about uh, you know, his top hits of um, fake news, from smoking to climate change to hate propaganda that puts minorities in the, on the spot, and the US invasion of Iraq, you know? And uh, where does it go beyond this? Uh, so I think today we've got a, a wonderful panel here, two veteran journalists and 
and a special scholar. And I'm eager to hear from all three. Uh, but first up will be Farish, Farish Noor, who is um, from the Rajaratnam School. Uh, read his bio over there. I know him as a prolific commentator in the newspaper, producer of books, he appears on TV. I can't keep up with this man, so I think, I, I hope he will take two minutes to tell us how he packs it all into a single day and week. Uh, and, and Farish is going to go a step beyond Chariot, who only stayed in the 20th and 21st century, because he's going to go back into the 19th century and, and talk about uh, language games played by Europeans in, in this space that we now call Southeast Asia. So Farish, over to you. Yeah. Um, can I? Yeah. Uh, is it all right if I just, okay. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, my apologies beforehand, because I happen to be a historian, so um, I, I prefer to dwell in the 19th century. Uh, on, on the subject of fake news and, and media distortions and the power of, of the media, um, uh, allow me to state from the outset that if by fake news we are talking about um, the distortion or the selective framing of facts, then I really do not believe that we are in new territory here. There's a long history of this and it goes back to the beginning of the printing press and, and popular journalism. If we go back to the 19th century, and if we look at the major events that took place, of course, we're talking about the era of, of colonial power and colonial rule. And the media, uh, particularly the national media of the respective uh, colonial powers, played an instrumental role in framing that entire colonial project in terms that were palatable, acceptable, justifiable, and rational for their respective national audiences. And so, what we have in the 19th century is the emergence of the kind of media which until not too long ago we are familiar with, the printed media and also visual media. Let's not forget that even in the 19th century we already have visual media even before photographs. Uh, many examples come to mind, the London Illustrated News, the Graphic, um, uh, Le Petit Journal in, 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 in France, uh, Le, Paris, Le Parisien in, in France, which included in the narrative of Western colonial expansion images of the exotic East. So I want to somehow bring this discussion closer to home, to us here in Southeast Asia in particular. So I'm going to th cite three examples of encounters between the West and Southeast Asia that can be broadly framed within you know, um, the, the, the broader context of that colonial encounter and how the media played a very interesting role in these three incidents. The three incidents I want to look at are, first, um, the attack on Kuala Batu in Sumatra in 1831-1832. Uh, very few people talk about this, but this was in fact America's first gunboat action in Southeast Asia, long before the conquest of the Philippines. Uh, the first uh, actual gunboat action took place in Sumatra. The second, of course, is um, widely reported, widely reported uh, encounter between Britain and Burma during the first, second, and third Anglo-Burmese wars of the 1820s, 1850s, and 1885. And thirdly, to bring it a bit closer to us in the present, um, the invasion and eventual conquest of the Philippines um, following the America-Spanish War. These three cases were cases of colonial encounters between East and West, and in all three cases, they were mediated. They were mediated in the sense that news, information uh, about what was happening abroad uh, in Southeast Asia was transmitted back to their national audiences. And to go back to the earlier point raised uh, in, in, in the opening speech, um, these, this news was, was targeted towards a national audience that was meant to accept, digest, and understand why these Western countries were doing what they were doing in Asia. Let's start with Kuala Batu. Kuala Batu is an interesting uh, um, uh, thing, but uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at my 
time clock here, and, and I, I, do, I do not have uh, six hours to talk about it. But basically, Kolobatu boils down to this. In, in uh, the 1830s, an American uh, commercial ship was basically hijacked uh, off the coast of Sumatra. And as a wreck of reprisal, uh, an American warship, the frigate USS uh, Potomac, was sent to Sumatra on a punitive mission. It led to the first bombing of Southeast Asia by the United States Navy. Now, what's interesting about this is that the controversy became political after the event, not before. And what was basically an incident in Sumatra, in the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, became a political controversy back in America. Why? Because this was the time of the presidency of Andrew Jackson, who was uh, heading towards an election. The American press, even then, in the 1830s, digested information about what had happened in Sumatra and immediately became partisan. This was one of the, the, the longest running uh, disputes in the American media that actually extended from 1832, 33, all the way to 1834, as Jackson was first heading towards his election. And it divided American public opinion as to whether this punitive action was justifiable, it was a reprisal against an act of piracy, or whether it was a case of wholesale slaughter. And here, so today when we talk about you know, the American media being divided and not having one audience, this is, this is not new. This is not new. Even the, in the 1830s, newspapers that were either partisan to Jackson's Democratic Party or the opposition Whigs at the time um, uh, were already selectively foregrounding information back to the American public. How many people were killed? Why was it attacked? Why was there no negotiation? And the intention here was to basically, basically discredit the establishment of Andrew Jackson and to accuse the commander and the troops of the USS Potomac of wanton slaughter of, of uh, innocent women and children. That was the phrase used, you know, butchers of women and children. So what we have here is basically a case of political conflict between you know, rival factions in America where Southeast Asia is reduced to the backdrop. The net result of this is the image of Southeast Asia as the land of pirates. And this is a recurring image that continues until today. Let's look at the second example. And this, this is basically three examples. The first, second, and third Anglo-Burmese wars of 1820s, 1850s, and 1885. Now, when we look at how Britain eventually comes to dominate Burma, the kingdom of Burma, a few salient points stand out. One, especially during the second and third last Anglo-Burmese wars, these wars were highly reported. They were widely reported with a lot of information, a lot of visual information, particularly from the London Illustrated News uh, and, and, and um, newspapers like that back in England. What I find interesting about the way in which um, the British eventual conquest of Burma was cast, it was the way that Burma was cast. Increasingly, because again, this is a mediated event, um, certain tropes, certain metaphors, certain terms become key terms that are repeated again and again in the British press. The one word that pops up again and again in a lot of the media reports then was the phrase, the Burman Empire the Burman Empire. This was the adversary. The adversary was the Burman Empire. And what I find interesting about the first, second, and third Anglo-Burmese wars is the way in which Burma, an independent kingdom in Southeast Asia, was portrayed as something more than what it was, an empire, the term empire. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that the empire then was the British Empire. Uh, and Burma's actions uh, moving its troops to the borders with Bengal, from a Burmese point of view, made perfect sense because the newly arrived aggressive military power was the East India Company that after controlling Calcutta was actually expanding its imperial uh, domain across northern India. So Burma panics. It's perfectly understandable that King Bagido and his future monarchs of, of Burma would be on the defensive, fearful that as the East India Company expanded its influence militarily across India, Burma would be next. So here you have a, a very interesting case where Burma's 
movements, uh, moving troops to the border, crossing the river, building fortifications, are reported accurately, because that was happening, but, ac but reported in terms that presented Burma as the belligerent, whereas actually Burma was on the defensive. And this culminates with you know, uh, the, 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 the very intense uh, uh, media campaign against the last kings of, of Burma, King, King uh, Thibo and Mindon uh, in the 1880s, where when we look at uh, British tabloid media in particular, you know, the caricatures of the Burmese emerge, you know, the Burmese tyrant, the Burmese despot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the reason why I find the first, second, and third Anglo-Burmese wars interesting is the way in which Burma was, was talked up as a sort of aggressive power, and we see similar tactics at work. I mean, when you look at the, the way in which, you know, perhaps the threat of Iraq was exaggerated uh, to some extent. The only thing Burma was then accused of was having weapons of mass destruction. But there's a lot of similarity to the way in which Burma was cast uh, when we look at the way in which the media, the international media, operates today. And finally, the last example I'll give is something that I think many of us are familiar with, uh, which is the eventual colonization of the Philippines, which is the net result of the American-Spanish War. Now, the American-Spanish War perhaps is the one case, and ma many people have already written about this, the American-Spanish War uh, was really one of the instances where we really see fake news. Uh, fake news in the sense that what started it was the incident in Havana when an American ship explodes, and this is seen as, as a, you know, the catalyst to actually move in um, and, 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 and occupy uh, Havana, Cuba, and this leads to the uh, American-Spanish War, uh, and with that, the occupation of not only uh, uh, Cuba, but eventually the loss of all the Spanish colonies, Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Now, the way in which the war in the Philippines was reported then, I find, is interesting because it, there are basically two wars. One, it's the war against the Spanish, which is seen as a war of liberation because Spain is then cast as an imperial power. But then what happens when your erstwhile allies, the Filipinos, then demand independence? And here a major shift happens. And when we look at the popular media, the pop media uh, of you know, 1900, 1901, 1902, when we look at the way in which Filipinos were depicted, particularly in caricatures, in magazines like Puck or even Life uh, at the time, uh, a, a, a very interesting shift happens. At the early stage, when the Filipinos were allies, they were depicted as freedom-loving people, yearning for independence, allies who are brave and courageous. An almost immediate shift happens when the Filipinos demand their own independence and not to be colonized again. What do we see? We begin to see caricatures, again caricatures. We begin to see caricatures of Filipinos, and this is particularly true in the cartoons that we see in Puck magazine, where almost instantaneously, overnight, Filipinos are presented as dark-skinned, curly-haired, thick-lipped savages. There's a very famous image of the leader of the Filipino uh, independence movement, Aguinaldo, Emilio Aguinaldo, uh, depicted as the character Topsy from um, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, Filipinos are, are then drawn, uh, armed with spears, wearing grass skirts, and it's an extraordinary shift that happens just in the space of a couple of years. And it's interesting to note that at this time, and this is where we really begin to see the emergence of popular media for mass consumption by national audiences, we begin to see how these nations that have command of, of, of um, uh, uh, modern modes of printing, modern modes of mass communication, all have their own national narratives. If you were to go back, and you can easily uh, look this up on, 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 on Yahoo or Google, you can look for these images, cartoons of the American Filipino War, contrast the cartoons and the drawings and the photos uh, in the popular American press about the Filipinos and contrast that to see the cartoons and drawings done by the non-American press, the European press. Uh, for example, in all the depictions of the American-Filipino war in the French press, in, in, in uh, uh, Le Petit Journal, in, in Le Parisien, for example, the Filipinos look human. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the French press were not 
guilty of caricatures because their caricatures were the caricatures of the Algerians, the Moroccans, the Arabs, who were the victims of French colonization in Africa. So in summing up, if you go back to the 19th century, we already find ample evidence of what today we regard as this somewhat dangerous phenomenon of distortion, uh, reductionism, reducing complex uh, issues to oversimplified nuggets of information that are meant to be consumed in a very partisan way. To reiterate, the first example, the Kolobatu incident, was clearly a case where something that happens in Southeast Asia is used for political mileage back home in America for purely political reasons in the conflict between the Whigs and the Democrats. In the case of the Anglo-Burmese Wars, the Anglo-Burmese Wars were basically you know, Britain's uh, imperial conquest of South and Southeast Asia, but cognizant of the fact that there was at that time in England already an anti-colonial movement in England itself, there was a need to somehow justify this invasion of Burma by hyping up the threat of Burma, whereas basically Burma was defending itself. And finally, in the case of the American-Filipino War, we hear, here we see you know, uh, the way in which the news was used to somehow rationalize and justify what was, for many um, Americans uh, at the time, a contradiction of America's stated purpose. At the beginning of the 19th century, America emerges in the world as a country that avows not to ever become a colonial power. Because that's why, you know, I mean, in, in, you see this, especially in the early uh, American press uh, around the 1780s, 1790s, and 1800s, constantly editorial saying, we are different. We are not going to make the mistakes of Europe. We are not going to conquer the world. We come in peace. We come to trade. A huge shift takes place in a space of one century, where by the end of it, America, like the European powers, celebrates empire. And the only way you can celebrate empire is by demonizing the other, exoticizing the other as the savage. So, so in summing up, I think when we look at the way in which you know, communities, uh, individuals, ideologies, religions today are being, you know, cast uh, in, in a sort of distorted light, framed in a particular way, in a dialectical way, as the other, the savage, the intolerant, or what have you. Uh, the historian in me uh, would remind all of us that um, these things are not entirely new. There's a long history of it uh, that can actually be dug up in, in uh, the archives of, of uh, media reports and newspapers that thankfully are well documented today. So I think with that, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Farish. Now, that's a way to make history sound like news. And I bet some people have tweeted it already. But, uh, okay, we're going to move back to the 21st century and now. And uh, coming up next is Eric uh, Wishart who has spent 30 years with AFP and part of that time uh, as its first non-French uh, CEO. Um, and, uh, sorry, editor-in-chief, you know, non-French editor-in-chief. Um, Eric is um, involved in all kinds of, of journalism-related work now and has been involved in uh, drawing up guidelines on ethics and uh, for journalists. Uh, at our AJF meeting earlier this week, we also learned from our, the AFP Bureau Chief in, in Singapore about the work that, that AFP is doing to come up with guidelines for newsrooms uh, for, that send reporters out in conflict situations. And so many of us uh, assign our people to dangerous assignments without uh, giving enough thought to, uh, to what they are going to experience and what they may experience after they come back from those assignments. Uh, Eric has been researching uh, the effect of fake news in Asia. And, and today he will share with us some of what he has, uh, he has learned. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Alan, and thank you for the promotion. I was actually the first 
non-French editor-in-chief. I wasn't the first non-French CEO. <laughs> uh, so good morning. Thank you. Very interesting introductory talk there. So, um, so for those of you who are not that familiar with AFP, we're, we're present in, in uh, virtually every country in the world. In, in, the, in the past year, we opened a bureau in North Korea. And I mean, what I say these days is we're as much news verifiers as news gatherers with the, with the explosion of social media and uploaded content. It's unusual now where news agencies used to be, always be the first with the news. More often it's posted on, on uh, social media. So news verification very, has been a big issue for us. And of course, uh, we're like the gatekeepers. So we, we verify uploaded content before we, we, we storify it and send it on to our our clients. And um, yeah, as Alan said, in the past year, I drew up new uh, ethical guidelines for AFP. And they're published, they're on the AFP site, they're published in English, French, Arabic, Spanish, and they're about to be published next month in Simplified Chinese. So if any of you would like uh, a link to that, just send me an email or ask me after this talk. But one of the, I start off in the guidelines with the importance of accuracy, but also truth. I mean, when I started as a journalist, all you had to do was report facts accurately. Now you report accurately, but very quickly have to also put it in context. Context, Seek the truth, because there is so much false information out there. Um, so just to slightly define what we're talking about today, I mean, fake news has, has emerged in the last year or two as a bit of a buzzword, but I would say fake news is a sort of subset of this disinformation ecosystem that Cherian spoke about last night. And I mean, just to sort of, to give us sort of my interpretation, I would say of, of fake news, it's, it's fabricated or manipulated content presented as legitimate news with the intent, and often it's malicious, to deceive. Um, and I think it's also important to know what fake news is not. Uh, and this is fake news. I mean, I, I was trying to find a kind of funny recent example. This was, I think Alex Jones in Infowars gave this a bit of prominence, this crazy story that NASA's got kidnapped children on Mars. And, um, and actually NASA sort of dignified it with a denial, which was sort of ridiculous. So, so, you know, it's a sort of theater they absurd. But, you know, researching fake news can be kind of fun, you know. But, um, so what is, what is not fake news? And I like this little snapshot of Nigel Farage with the guy saying he's lying to you. Fake news is not a politician or a public figure's lies. That's not fake news. Um, it's not, sorry. Sorry, I seem to be, oh, I'm going the wrong way there. Yeah, it's not a politician's lies. It's not um, a journalist's legitimate mistake. It's also not a story that a, journal, a, a politician or a, or a public figure doesn't like. I mean, despite what Donald Trump says, CNN and New York Times are not fake news. Um, somebody asked last night when Cherian was speaking, why do we talk about fake news so much now? I, I call it a perfect storm, actually. Um, we have a, a, a situation, it's very easy now to, with software to, to upload fake content online to make it look real. You can have an imposter site which mimics a, a genuine news site. It's, it's very easy to upload and post this stuff. Um, I think there's also a particular situation worldwide of toxic political and social environments. The whole migrant issue in, in Europe, which was a big source of fake news before we even got to Donald Trump. So th these certainly fuel it. And then, of course, the third thing is the catalyst of, of social media, which can disseminate this, this kind of uh, bogus information at the speed of light. In the old days, the supermarket tabloids, the National Enquirer, I mean, you bought it and it didn't go that far. Now you post something online, it goes around the world very quickly. Um, so turning to Asia, and, you know, somebody asked me last night, I mean, is there really much of a fake news problem in Asia? Everybody's sort of obsessed with Donald Trump. The answer is yes, major problem. And what struck me was not only the extent of it, my friend from uh, Bhutan last night said they even have a fake news problem in trolling in, in, in Bhutan when it comes to elections everywhere in Asia. And the reasons are diverse, and this is, I think, why it's so difficult to combat fake news in countries like 
like for example in India, um, people are posting this kind of content to, to, to stoke communal, communal strife. This was, this was posted and widely shared online. This is, this is an image that purports to show Muslim men uh, baiting a, a Hindu woman. In other countries, Korea, the Philippines, fake news is more used for political ends. Um, and also, and I think somebody quoted an example in Singapore quite recently where it was, it was a, a site set up to make money. So there's a big financial motive. You post this kind of stuff, you can make money from, from advertising clicks. So there's multiple motivations behind fake news. And, I mean, to show how easy it is to... I mean, there have been lynchings in, in India because of, 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 of this kind of rumour. Um, this was actually a clip from a film two years ago. I mean, completely fake, but people circulated this. There was, an M there was a politician retweeted it. Um, and this is how easy it is to post something so dangerous. Um, and this was another crazy example. Um, this uh, site posted a story saying that the Israelis had accused, had, had threatened Pakistan with a, a nuclear attack if they, they intervened in Syria. And uh, the Pakistani defense minister, if you'd actually read the story twice, they'd have realized it was completely ridiculous, um, threatened retaliation against Israel. I mean, you know, it shows you how things can get out of hand. And the Israelis, who have have never declared themselves as a nuclear power, didn't waste any time to reply and say, you know, this, this, this story was completely fake. So, you know, this, this was, it never really went anywhere, but the fact two nuclear powers can get involved in a Twitter war because of fake news is, is pretty scary. Then, of course, there's this sort of silly aspect of things like, uh, I mean, this was a good one. And this is an imposter site. This is a site that mimics BBC Online but it's not the BBC online. Uh, 42 midgets in Cambodia did not have a fight with a lion. But, I mean, this is the kind of um, imposter site you can, you can have. So, I mean, throughout Asia, there's, there's a real issue, issue with, with fake news. So when I was researching this talk, I spoke to Regina Ries, who's the vice president for news at um, ABS-CBN in, in the Philippines. She said that one of the, it was quite interesting, something I discovered, that the two big um, mobile phone operators in the Philippines offer free access to Facebook as part of the package. So, you know, I think a lot of people in the Philippines um, top up their loads on their phones. So if you, if you access Facebook, you don't use up your data allowance, right? So, and she said, I'm quoting her, that to a lot of people in the Philippines, Facebook is the internet which creates this closed echo chamber, which we closed environment, which makes it very easy to propagate fake news and, and propaganda. And they have been very active, actually. They, they've, they've set up this sort of outreach program in partnership with universities and schools around the Philippines. And this is a, a photograph of one of their, their classes where they teach media literacy. And she said there's a big reaction from young people in the Philippines are very keen to be able to learn how to, to tell fact from fiction. Um, Hong Kong, I would say the big threats to the media in Hong Kong are physical intimidation and attacks on journalists, um, a lack of access to official sources, uh, both officials and official information, uh, a refusal to accredit online media, just like something out of the 1990s, and, um, and self-censorship. But from the Occupy uh, Central um, period, there's also been a mini industry sprung up with fake news and rumors. And this was a recent one that reported that it was pretending to be a, a, a web, a news site that was affiliated with Fox News, um, saying that Donald Chung, the former um, chief executive, had committed suicide. And I mean, another example of, of the kind of initiatives that can be taken to fight this kind of thing uh, are being taken by Hong Kong University, where I'm going to be teaching uh, feature writing, actually, in the autumn. But they, they have two recent projects. One is a cyber news verification lab, where students learn how to verify uploaded um, content from on social media, which is the kind of thing we do at AFP every day, which is, is very good. And also, in, in conjunction with Stony Brook University in the United States, um, they have um, uploaded this online uh, media literacy course, which is hosted on Coursera. 
This is actually an online version of a course that they've run at the university for, um, for the past few years. And since it was posted in January, there's been about 7,000 people have signed up for it in 125 countries. Um, quickly turning to China, um, there's a bit of sense of vindication, I think, in China these days, because when China launched its campaign against fake news and rumors, everybody said, as usual, it's the cracking down on freedom of expression. Of course, when we in the West do it, it's fight fake news, it's defend democracy. So the, the, the Global uh, Times made this comment recently. Also, preparing for the conference, I spoke to Manya um, Kutsi, who runs this What's on Weibo site, which is quite interesting. For those of us who don't speak Chinese, it gives a bit of a, an insight into what's happening on social media in, in China. And she says beyond the, I mean, people all, a little knowledge of China always goes a long way. And there's always a lot of people like to oversimplify actually what's happening in China. And she said an interesting aspect in China is there's actually quite a grassroots uh, movement in China to, to, to seek out fake stories. And a lot of the fake information circulation, circulating on the social networks in, in China are actually social related stories. So she said there's quite a, quite a movement within the netizens, as we call them, to, 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 to call out people posting fake information. So China's a very interesting example of, of this. Of, you know, it's not that straightforward, obviously, with the censorship, but there's a lot going on in China on this, this front. Um, back to AFP. First draft is it's, it's a, it's a non-profit which sort of emerged out of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University in New York. Uh, it's headed up by a woman called Claire Waddle, very brilliant, who's a real expert on, on uh, verification of online content. And AFP, uh, AP, BBC, a lot of major news outlets are um, members of this coalition, along with uh, Google and Facebook. And, I mean, I think this is quite a good example of the kind of thing you could probably do in... Um, in, in certain countries in Asia. For the French elections, we had a, uh, a project called Crosscheck, where people, when they saw bogus stories or potentially bogus stories circulating, they could uh, message the Crosscheck project and it was checked out. And um, there was a coalition of media who were checking this. AFP had the final word. The um, um, once it was reviewed, it would be sent to AFP for a final review, and then we would post the result online. So, for example, this was a story that Emmanuel Macron opened an offshore account. Um, it was flagged false. It was manufactured, because sometimes stories aren't manufactured. They're just posted out of context. So they're, they're false, but they're not. This was actually a manufactured story, and it also said cross-checked by and the different media that cross-checked it. And I was quite surprised, actually, you know, having worked in France a long time, how quickly the whole fake news and disinformation machine got going in, in France in the French elections. So this was debunking um, fake news and, and, and bogus stories very quickly, and it was quite effective, actually. It shut down a lot of these things before they got much traction. I mean, there's always going to be a percentage of people are going to believe it. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. But I thought it was effective, and I thought it was the kind of thing that some countries, and you know, if you're if you're facing an election, um, um, this kind of coalition is, is is a good thing to do. So I would just say very quickly. I mean, Asia is a big region, and you can't really um, boil it down into a 15-minute presentation. But I would say. I mean, I would say the three takeaways from what I've, I've seen in my little investigation into this before this conference is A, yep, fake news is everywhere in, in Asia, and in some countries it's a serious problem, provoking communal strife or whatever. Um, it has to be tackled. I think that on one hand, I think this kind of, uh, there's a lot of very good independent fact-checking um, sites have opened up, particularly active India, the Philippines, I think we've got somebody from one of the Philippine sites here today. Um, but I think it's also good to do it individually, but it's difficult to have that maximum impact on your own. So I think this kind of thing, in fact, First Draft is developing in Asia. I think to be a member of a coalition to serve, share ideas is very good. And I also think also this kind of outreach program, this media literacy that I give the examples of Hong Kong and the Philippines are, 
are very useful. So, so thanks for listening. My time is up, and I look forward to discussing this as the day goes on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, next up is Wayu Murgadi from Temple, a veteran of that newsroom too. And uh, before fake news became the buzzword here, uh, the Indonesian uh, journalists who used to come for the, the AJF fellowship program would talk each year about hoaxes. Hoax news was the was the thing they would talk about. They say it happens all the time, it's hard to keep up with, uh, it gets worse around election times, and, and what, what do journalists need to do? Uh, especially in these days when um, everyone is racing to be first with the news, to catch the trend that's out there, and to report it or be left behind. Uh, this is a, a reality for journalists to grapple with every day. Uh, Wayu has been working on exactly this for a number of years now, and he will talk to us about the, the efforts Tempo has made to deal with fake news, to debunk hoaxes as they turn up, uh, and what journalists have to do in this newsroom. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Alan John, for giving me a chance to uh, share uh, how Tempo uh, fight with the uh, hawks. Uh, so to make a better understanding, uh, let me, before talking this, uh, about this interesting topic, let me explain the political context. In Indonesia, especially during the new order regime under the Suharto's uh, leadership and its relation to Tempo. We were banned by the uh, uh, authorities uh, by the government of under Suharto in 1994 for criticizing the purchase of 37 youth warships uh, from Eastern Europe because we have been informed by the credible sources that the project has left many big question marks. We can call it a fake project maybe uh, because some of those warships were uh, sunk and uh, wrecked. Finally, Suharto was overthrown and resigned. Then came the era of reform, which allowed everybody to publish mass media without special permission. Means uh, there is uh, no longer need a license anymore. There was an euphoria in the history of the press industry in Indonesia, as everyone competed to start this business. At the time, there were at least 3,000 new publications, not including online media, that were still un not popular at that time. And then finally failed to complete. Now the remaining only hundreds media. Uh, Tempo was finally reborn in 1998. Uh, we are also required to be able to answer the high public expectation, which during the Suharto government received a lot of disinformation. We are determined to present reliable information and emphasize our role as a clearinghouse of information. This task, of course, is not easy because it requires professional skills and, of course, the patience to face the pressure of the various forces that do not want the crimes they do known by the press. We then also affirm our position as the media that prioritizes investigative journalism techniques that have been guaranteed by the law. This new era of press freedom was uh, then controlled by the series of code of ethics established by the press councils, journalist associations, as well as Tempo itself. This task is getting heavier when the internet and online media come up with the speed to inform. Online media phenomenon, coupled with the social media, increasingly cultivate new challenges in presenting new speed, but still accurate. This, information, this tsunami of information, let me quote uh, Bill Kovacs, uh, produced a lot of false news beyond the propagandas designed by the authorities. But 
Now, the false or the fake news, mostly produced by the private sector or the public, because of the freedom of expression now in Indonesia. Now, let me start to uh, share to you and how Tempo fact check the hoax. Uh, hoax in Indonesia. At first, we didn't realize uh, that the scope of this phenomenon and only devoted a tiny friction, fraction of resources to cover it uh, due to, to our limitation. Since early 2016, means last year, we had a special channel to debunk hoax at our new site. You can see uh, www.tempo.co, slices topic, etc., etc. And uh, I wish I could claim that we are the, the first media, the first, the pioneer of the media who really debunk uh, the hoax in Indonesia. We only debunk hoax that related to news and current affairs and not every pieces of misinformation that become viral on social media. Uh, for example, you can see uh, the picture on the top. Kabar Menara Masjid Raya Bandung roboh bikin warga panik. Means the, the tower of the Grand Mosque in Bandung in West Java province collapse. It makes the people panic, but it is untrue. We check quickly and uh, make the uh, clarify the information and publish to the to the to the to the our online. And the second one, hawks, WhatsApp uh, change the colors. Untrue. As and uh, become the victim of hawks, Vice President Yusuf Kala GK asked to the people. Uh, be careful to read the news. Yeah, even the, our vice president was a victim of the hawks. Hawks also it happened in Pontiana. It was uh, uh, published by the, our, the media in, in, in local media. It was uh, riots in Pontiana. That's why Minister of Information Rudy Antara talked to the people not to be provoked by those uh, fake news. Now, come to the election time. Things changed when the election came and hawks become even more visible and dangerous. Even Tempo <laughs> become the victim of hawks. People use our trusted brand to spread rumors and lies. See the, the headline of those Koran Tempo titled, uh, quoted, quote a hoax. A hoax is the nickname of the uh, a governor of Jakarta at that time, he says, according to that fake news, if he win the election, the governorship election, he will build a greater church, even bigger than Istiqlal Mosque. Of course, it's untrue, fake, because Istiqlal is the, the third biggest mosque in the world after in Makkah and Medina and then Istiqlal in Jakarta. Even the Istiqlal Mosque is the uh, number one, the biggest uh, mosque in the Southeast Asia. So it's uh, untrue. This other example, this the, they claim that this is a fact, the, uh, the what do we call, the, 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 the dead body of uh, the old ladies cannot uh, worship in the mosque just because he support uh, Governor Ahok. But this is untrue. Yeah, we check in the uh, location, but uh, surprisingly, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, banner, so many posters in the, in the street that mention that uh, everybody who support Ahok cannot be prayed at the mosque. They use the fake uh, ayat or fake verses of the uh, Sharia law. And the next uh, kabar hoax, the Pondok Pesantren Ulama, uh, the FBI members, uh, Islamic boarding school, burned by the Islam, uh, uh, Indonesian Communist Party. 
It is untrue because there is no even a single member of uh, FBI, is a radical uh, Islamic movement there in, in Indonesia, has an Islamic boarding school. And even the Indonesian Communist Party will not exist anymore because it was banned by the government, but by the law since 1967. But it is spread everywhere, and then we uh, give the uh, clarification about that. And also we set up a special design for the uh, uh, governorship of uh, election in Jakarta. We call it Spilkada 2017 with the special election coverage. And fact checking, within the special election coverage, we include a channel solely dedicated to debunk any hoax made by candidates during the election. So we name the rubrics, the, 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 uh, the channel is Saling Silang. Saling Silang is cross-check among the candidates. Yeah. And during the election, our fact-checking team produced fact-check posts in daily basis. We check all the statements made by the candidates one by one and give the, uh, what is the fact, uh, tempo version. See, this is the structure, how we uh, present or we uh, publish that uh, information. See, the, the red color is the source of a statement or claim that being checked. And the green one is the fact after we check. And the blue one is the reference or the basis of our fact. It is live fact checking. We even went further during the three rounds of public debate between candidates. It is the uh, rating number one in all the television because most of the public of Indonesia, especially in Jakarta, spend their time to see the, this uh, talk show live, broadcasted live on all television channels. We did live fact-checking supported by 15 reporters. We deployed 15 reporters on the spot, and we check every claim made by the candidates during the debate and publish our fact-checking via Facebook and Twitter. See the example of the result. For example, when they are talking about the uh, uh, reform of biocracy, there is a quotation by, uh, from the Anis Baswedan, one of the candidates, and he, became, he, he, he won the election and became the next, our next uh, uh, governor of Jakarta. He says that the uh, governor of Jakarta never has an excellent statement from the uh, audit board of Indonesia. And it says like that, and then we check. But in the year of 2012, uh, Jakarta governor got those excellent statement or opinion from the uh, auditor board of Indonesia. And uh, on the other side, we also quote the, check the statement of uh, President uh, Governor uh, uh, Ahok, uh, Basuki Cahayapurnama. He says that uh, we've been uh, built apartment near by the terminal, bus terminal as well as the rain station. But in the fact, they start since 2016 planning to build an apartment uh, near the terminal as well as the station. So that's the, the result. And then, so what is the lesson learned? First, media should play a larger role in fact checking and debunking hoax or misinformation. But I really appreciate with the Mr. Professor Sherin. He said to us last night, that uh, I think one step ahead behind, uh, behind me because uh, not only just the debunking but the pre-bunk. <laughs> it's an interesting statement, interesting uh, term. All viral hoax should be debunked, not only the one related to news. One hoax spread without fact is too many. 
develop a way to engage with the audience so hoax can be reported to the media and fact-checked. Fact-checking is more crucial during the election so people can vote with the confidence and firm understanding of each candidate profile and records. This is very important, I think. And keep the election fact-checking fair and balanced for the all candidates. So then let uh, fact-checking become a political tool for and against any candidate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Time for Q&A, but uh, exactly half an hour, <laughs> and we'll be watching the clock closely. And I'm going to go directly to Q&A. Can you just go up to the microphone nearest to you, and uh, please tell us who you are and where you're from, and who your question is directed at? Yes, my name is. Is this on? Yes. Uh, I'm Ulrich Ecker from the University of Western Australia. I'm a psychologist. Um, I have a question for Farish. I enjoyed your talk, and I agree with you that um, it's, this is not a new phenomenon, right? It's always been framing. There's always been distortion. Um, but I would argue that it is a somewhat of a new phenomenon in that it's going beyond distortion, beyond framing, and it's now a substantial segment of the populace and leaders of the world who now seem to be living in an alternative reality where it's not just you know, presenting facts in a certain way, but it's just making things up entirely. So do you think there's a qualitative shift there? I, I see one, but I'm, I, I would like to get your opinion on that. Thank you. I think, we, uh, I think we need to have an agreed uh, definition on what exactly is fake news. Because uh, according to uh, Mr. Fari's uh, uh, explanation is that, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's propaganda has been around for centuries. And then uh, the media, I mean, we have, as, as a journalist, I have to admit that I, I too, frame a certain uh, event in a certain way. Because it's, it's, it's pretty common in, in journalism for, for any newspapers, like uh, Washington Post and New York Times have liberal bias, and then uh, other, uh, such a Wall Street Journal or probably Fox News is, of course, for this more like pro-Republican, pro-Trump even. So that's, that's a problem. How, how do we uh, decide the, the limits? What counts as fake news and what counts as what I say, why, 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 why would uh, consider it as, as, a, as a run of the mill uh, uh, framing that journalists often do, which is, I don't think it's not always uh, unacceptable. That's it. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, no, I'll let Farish answer this. Can I take a photo? Yeah, and then ask. Is it related? Yeah, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> all right. <coughs> also, a historian, this one. <laughs> this is for Farish as well. I'm Vikhar. I'm a journalist from India. So my questions follow on from here. So I think the examples that you gave, the three examples that you cited, were more, I mean, were more of propaganda at a certain point, right? And if we perhaps read Noam Chomsky back, this can be understood, or Edward Said even. And uh, I'd... Another, perhaps a more appropriate example from your own work would be uh, about the Singapore mutiny, where Indian soldiers in Singapore mutinied because they felt that they were going against Islam. Uh, and the fake news at that point was that the Kaiser converted, right? So historically, it'll be good if you can provide some guidelines of how to distinguish. And then, uh, <coughs> I have a question for the other panelists as well. Uh, a lot of our resources, I mean, uh, Eric mentioned that we've become news verifiers, right? And as journalists, a lot of my colleagues will agree that we're distracted from our core task of going out and reporting because half the time we're spending our resources on verifying news, right? I mean, I remember uh, last year, I spent 10 days following the a trail of an 18th century king in southern India because uh, there were allegations that he was a religious bigot and he had converted thousands of Hindus in the 18th century and there were riots in India in 
2016 because of this. And I spent 10 days following his campaign trail where, while I was supposed to be out and doing other reporting, right? So I, I, I just don't know. It's, it's half the time we are responding to fake news. So, so in terms of resources, it's just a drain. So I'd like a comment. Thank you. Okay, so we let uh, Parish go first. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Parish will answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, very, very briefly. Um, I think if by fake news, and I'll, I'll, I, I, I like uh, the way uh, Eric uh, uh, described it, this, this uh, uh, adding a slant uh, with perhaps uh, an intent, possibly a malicious intent, or a propaganda intent, or a political intent. Um, it, 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 when I go back, and I only read 19th century newspapers, by the way, so when you go back, I, I'm amazed by, by one thing, the amount of information. I mean, it's actually extraordinary how detailed the information was conveyed back to their national audiences. So again, if you read just the London Illustrated News, yeah, uh, and its account of the first, second, and third Anglo-Burmese wars, we know exactly how many soldiers they were, we know what they were carrying, we know where they went, we know where they camped. The amount of information is accurate, and that's why, until today, I can still use the London Illustrated News as a historical reference, because it's correct. It's the slant that worries me. And to go back to your question then, this is the problem, the slant. Now obviously there has to be, you know, it, we all look at things in perspective. I'm looking at this from my perspective, you're looking at it, that's normal. But I think we need to be careful of the trap of a kind of dangerous uh, excessive relativism here, where if every perspective is correct, then I think that, you know, Colonialism means colonialism. Slavery is slavery. There are no two ways of looking at it. It's like when there was a time when, for example, when we discussed apartheid, and perhaps there was more consensus worldwide that apartheid had a moral value, was a negative moral value. There, no, no one was was debating, you know, whether this is right or wrong or justifiable or what have you. And I think that 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 goes back to the, your concern, the, the, the first question. If if we if we are worried today about large numbers of people, um, you know, perhaps uh, believing the earth is flat, for example, or believing that there's no climate warming. Well, again, I'm sorry as a historian, um, you know, in the 19th century, millions of people thought empire was perfectly justifiable. In fact, they thought empire was good. So again, this is not new, this mass, now, now do we call this mass delusion? I don't like using the term delusion because it implies that uh, uh, you know, there's a kind of madness going on, but there is a consensus, and I think that's where the media comes in. When I look at the way in which uh, European and American papers uh, in the 19th century uh, uh, built up a consensus that empire was good or that this was a civilizing project, what, what worries me the most is the fact, uh, are two things, one, the fact that they were persuasive because they spoke the language of the time. Empire was justified through science, through genetics, through Darwinism. And, and in that sense, th there's a zeitgeist going on there. And I think if we look at what's going on today, the kind of uh, insanity that we're seeing around us, that's, that's a symptom of our times. We're all historical beings. We live in history. And it's a symptom of our history at the moment, living as we do in the age of late industrial capitalism, uh, uh, and on the verge of the fourth um, you know, technological revolution, this anxiety, this panic that people see about future jobs, or whether artificial intelligence will replace human beings, that feeds into these anxieties that easily get twisted into ethno-nationalist campaigns, hate pogroms, or what have you. So I think that's, that's the, the worry that I have. But to, 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 to the first question, all I'm saying is that this is again not new, this mass belief that slavery, for example, was justifiable because Africans are not fully human beings. This was widespread belief, and it spread beyond academia, by the way. It was in sciences. Harvard, Louis, uh, Louis Agassiz, for example, came up with the theory of, of polygenesis, of, of, of different races, different species, and not one human species. So I don't think we've left the 19th century in that sense. Um, um, but I cannot answer uh, 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 your question about how, how do we balance these perspectives. As a historian, I would come in and say, though, while 
empire was at its height, while colonialism and slavery were at its height. Let's not forget that there were many counterfactual voices. William Corbett, for example, the strongest critic of empire in England throughout his life, also ran a journal, uh, uh, Corbett's uh, weekly bulletin, and constantly fought against it. There was the anti-slavery society, the abolitionist society, the society for the protection of aborigines. So there was a contested debate. But I think the key question that we need to answer here, and I think this relates to our concerns today is, with all these counterfactual arguments to show that, for example, you know, we are one human race, that slavery is wrong, imperialism is wrong, you still cannot stop someone believing in empire any more than we today can stop someone who chooses to believe that there's no climate warming. What on earth can we do? And, and, and here I think this is where the role of the scientists, the academic, the journalists, you know, we reach a limit. We cannot get into the individual subjectivities of individuals and literally change their minds. Mm. I, if, 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 if I cannot convince someone that one plus one is two, there's nothing I can do. Clubbing him on the head is not gonna help anything. And, and, and I think this is where I, I, I really sympathize with you in, in the media field, because really you're in the battleground. You're in the battleground. How do you actually convince people that one plus one is two? Uh, uh, the historian like me can only write about this retrospectively. Um, so, so, so I, I, I can, I can, you know, in, in a sense, uh, say that m my only role is to record the history of madness, so to speak. But you are the guys who are confronting it head on, and I, I, I don't have the answer. All, all I can say is that, you know, we've we've dealt with this problem since the beginning of the printing press, and we are still living in, with it today. All right. Uh, uh, thanks, Farish. So now I'll move to Eric and, and Wayu for the other question from Vika. What's a hardworking journalist going to do? Are we spending too much time verifying uh, that we could be chasing down our stories and getting better information and talking to more people? Uh, and the other part of the, the whole fact-checking and verification industry that has sprung up uh, in recent times is that by the time you're doing the verification, the damage has been done. You know, the, the lies have gone out, have circulated massively, and you're, you are behind it, you know? So uh, what do we do about this? Well, actually, um, it's not quite the case because the fake story or the fake information has been uploaded, but until such times as AFP reports it, we haven't done the damage. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, so just because it's out there doesn't mean you report it. <coughs> okay. So you verify it. But I mean, yes, it's a huge issue on resources. Uh, that's why I was talking about these coalitions. I was impressed you did this all on your own. This, this. I mean, that's a big, big. <laughs> that's a big thing to do. I mean, in France, I mean, I mean, AFP could probably have done the done the verification for the French election, but I don't know how many people would have had to put on it. I mean, already I think we had ten people full time as part of the. Of, of this project, but I mean, I mean, you said you spent what a week, ten days um, checking this out. So I mean, I think um, it's a major, it's a major drain. It's one thing if you get two thousand mm -hmm. journalists; it's another thing if you get ten journalists. Mm -hmm. So this is why I think coalitions, working with other media, are important. Working with fact checkers, if you can, if you can set up a coalition of, of, of other media and fact checking, you, that 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 definitely saves a lot of time, and, um, but you can't avoid it. And, and a lot of the burden falls on the photo and video desks. It's, it's more a problem, it's pretty easy to, to debunk a sort of fake story as it were, that just pops up, you know, as a, as, as, a, as a text. But there's a lot of work, and I would say a lot, most of the stuff, most of the time you're, you're it's fake videos and fake photos. I mean, I got, I, I mean, I mean this five, Many years ago it was when Bin Laden was killed that, that day we got a, there was a photograph circulated online pretending to be a picture of him just after he was killed and other media had reported it. There's a lot of pressure on you. If other media have already pushed this stuff out, there's a lot of pressure on you to, to give it, you know, and we, we finally, we didn't and it turned out that it was a fake photograph. It actually circulated years earlier of, of Bin Laden. But then we, we, what we did was we then published the photograph and then explain why we why it was a fake. So, but this 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 took the morning up. This took or a couple of hours. So it's a real drain. So as I say, I think the best way is, and there's other 
ways to do it. For example, Storyful, I don't know if you're familiar with Storyful. I mean, they, this, is a, a, this is a company which it scans the internet or the online for, for, for videos, mainly videos, uh, checks it, and then once it's verified, puts it on its news feed for clients. So, 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 so they kind of do it for you. It's a sort of um, tailor-made service. But I mean, to try and take the, this whole verification burden on if you're a small media is, is really not very realistic. So I think, I think I would really say, you know, team up with other people, team up with fact checkers, that's, that's the way to go. Yes. Uh, thank you not for asking me, means uh, all of you maybe agree with what we did. <laughs> but uh, this is very important uh, a question from you, Alan, because, uh, you know, the damage has been done. So what, what, would we, what have we do as a journalist for the media? Because we play a big role. At least we try to minimize the risk, to minimize the risk. And then uh, we always educate the people, as well as the media people, to uh, publish the uh, information getting better and better, in a better way. You know, for example, uh, that's why uh, Tempo, for example, has an editorial policy. It is loud and clear uh, what about our opinion on certain issue. For example, in the country like Indonesia, which is uh, the uh, Muslim conservative now getting uprised, you know, you know, it's an issue. This is very important. For example, uh, the view, video uh, uh, upload in YouTube by the, about the Ahok, uh, governor uh, incumbent of Jakarta, uh, Basuki Cahaya Purnama or Ahok, speech in Pulau Seribu, for example, was edited by somebody into a certain fashion, not a longer one, edited a certain fashion, the video was then scattered with additional notes by academia, yeah, with the, an academia and become a viral and angered Muslims, then sparked a massive demo throughout history in Indonesia. You know, the millions of people demonstration on the street and asked Ahok to be punished. And you know what? Now he's been punished by the mobrocracy, mobrocracy, not the fair, you know, unfair. You know. So, our editorial policy, loud and clear, to tell to the people by our publication, but we emphasize that that Ahok speech is not insulting Islam, nothing to do with the blasphemy. So this is clear. We have to do that. To the the the, the more the most important one of the the role of the media is to tell the truth, right? Hmm. This is at any cost, at any risk. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Seems to lead to questions of trust. But anybody has. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I'm Kasim from Sri Lanka. Uh, this is to uh, Tempo. Is uh, What has been your experience uh, once we have verified and uh, denied those stories, whether the respective websites have removed the postings? And also the danger of giving credence to following up on some of the stories uh, and uh, by over a month or two months, have you sort of discredited some of the websites or sources which comes out with fake news? And do, the, do people take you as an authority? Of course, we 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 do that kind of uh, project to you know to select all the resources. Uh, uh, where is the who is the credible resources to be quoted to interviewed by us? But which one is not published by us because of those uh, uh, bad stories uh, like that? So after so after you've done your verification and you proven that this is fake news. Yes. Do you get the source of the fake news to take it down? Do you tell people don't believe in that? Yes, of course, of course. Down. Yes, we did, it, we did it. Okay, thanks. There's a question there, and then Juni after that. Yeah. Good morning. I would just like to ask your practical advice uh, on how members of the traditional media can um, 
continue this advocacy against disinformation in an environment where um, bloggers or social media practitioners are accorded high or greater credibility by the public and even greater access by the government itself. Uh, Juni, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, morning. My name is Lao Juni. I'm a media educator as well as independent documentary maker. Um, also a former uh, program director of the AJF, so this is a program that's very close to me. Um, okay, uh, I think I'd like to pick up the point that our colleague over there made about definitions. I think uh, we use the word, the phrase fake news as a, as a very convenient term uh, simply because it's catchy and, you know, we, we think we know what it means, but at the same time, it's, it's a, a phrase that it means different things to different people. Is it satire? Is it parody? Is it propaganda? Is it a position we may not necessarily agree with? Uh, or is it a, an alternative interpretation of, of facts or a, a you know, position? So, so first, it's a, it's a definition problem, as, as has been mentioned, or a framing problem. Uh, secondly, I think we are seeing now, we talk about resources, the lack of resources, but we're also seeing now the rise of a new format of story, the debunking story. So increasingly, it's no longer uh, sufficient for us as journalists to actually just check out the facts and then just say, oh, uh, it's not worth a story, it's fake. But actually, it's actually increasingly important for us as journalists to, to actually print a story or publish a story that, that actually says this is a hoax. Because I think it's, things get so viral these days that people actually believe sometimes what they read, which is maybe misinformation. Um, so so that's, that's another thing, the rise of, uh, of a... a a new type of story. And with that, uh, Park Wayudi actually uh, brought up this you know, the great example of what um, your, your newsroom has done. Um, the way maybe of standardizing these labels as well. I mean, Google and um, Google especially has made some inroads in this in terms of verified or disputed. But I think as, as, a, as news organizations in general, perhaps there could be, we could consider ways of standardizing this so that consumers ultimately do not get confused in the way we present uh, news debunking stories about hoaxes. Thanks. Okay. Who would like to go first? Uh, um, uh, first question, what do you do when, when everyone can be a journalist these days and bloggers become stars and outshine the journalists and then lo and behold, uh, they get invited to uh, events where previously only journalists could go? Um, what's a journalist to do there? That's that one. Uh, Juni, I think, is looking for a definition of fake news. Can we all agree on what it means? And, um, and the rest, I think, were suggestions that, that maybe we can consider to have uh, standard terms that we all will use and understand. But bloggers, stars. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't think uploading, writing something and uploading it to the internet doesn't, this doesn't make you a journalist. I mean, journalism is a profession. I mean, there's, I wrote a code of ethics. We have a code. I also did the sourcing. I'm just, I'm in the process. It's a big job of, of updating our style book. I mean, journalism is a job. It's a profession. There's, a, there's ethics, there's, there's standards, and all the rest of it. But I, I also believe in the freedom to upload, to write and upload. It's wonderful. I mean, I think there's been more interest in journalism now than there has ever been. But I think that... Um, I think there's also been a realization when we, 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 people don't really talk about it much anymore, but there was this sort of explosion of what they called citizens journalism 10 or 15 years ago. And I think with the passage of time, as I say, I mean, you, there's some people that will not believe that there's such a thing as climate change, but I think a, a large majority of people have realized that there is a difference between just anything being posted online under the guise of journalism and actual proper verified journalism by established news outlets. It's not the same thing. Um, of course, the extension of that, is, which is the problem, is just somebody like me just reading the New York Times and the Washington Post, because I'm a, a, a liberal. You know, you, you also got to push yourself out of your echo chamber and read bright back news, even if you don't like it, or Fox News, just to see what, what's going on in the world from a different perspective. But, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, this is the problem in Hong Kong. They don't want to accredit online media because what's the difference between um, Hong Kong Free Press and a, and a blog post? But, I mean, to me, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a very liberal 
with a small L, if that's the right word, view to that. So fine if people want to blog, if they want to write about the news, great. But I mean, I think people also have to realize that, you know, if I walk into a sub, uh, into an operating theater covering, carrying a scalpel, it doesn't make me a, a surgeon, does it? And I don't think just posting something online with your name on it makes you a journalist either. So if you want to, I mean, if you want to go into that sort of definition. But, um, but it is an issue. I mean, I know that, for example, um, like in the White House, they're now um, given at least temporary accreditation to some pretty, I think even um, InfoWars got, a, got invited one day to a press con news conference. So there is, there is an element there of, of these of, of sort of fairly marginal media getting brought into the sort of mainstream news conference accreditation kind of situations. So. Thanks, thanks, Eric. Yes. Um, if I may follow on from there, I'd, I'd like to, 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 to uh, bring in technology here because I think this is important. This phenomenon that we're looking now, the need to verify and all that is because they are now communicative technologies which are new and that's the new thing compared to the 19th century. So hypothetically you can ask, well, you know, would, would, would the struggle against empire or against slavery, for example, have succeeded in the 19th century if there was Facebook then, mm. right? And because even then, the idea of the independent journalist, the pamphleteer, the writer, the, the anti-slavery movement was driven by pamphleteers, right? So, so people have always individually or as small groups contributed to discussions in the public domain. That's not new. I think now it's the multiplier effect and the speed with which uh, misinformation and bias can be actually uh, spread that's alarming. And this is not about media. It's about communications technology. And I think here is where I think in the discussion like this, we need to bring in people in the IT industry because they have created these technologies which basically today cannot be controlled anymore. If you were to, if you were to set this discussion in the 19th century, say you take back things like uh, Twitter, Google, or, or, or Facebook, or what have you, to the 19th century, there would be a huge reception or support for empire then. Mm -hmm. It would be shared in the same way that right now the so-called alt-right is, is basically a media phenomenon. I saw this in Germany where, where the rise of, 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 of neo-Nazis was basically an internet phenomenon. And this is where I worry because those who come up with these technologies must understand, you know, yeah, um, uh, Eric's point about the scalpel, for example, it, it, any tool can be used in any manner of ways. We all know this. And, and, and the potential of, of, of uh, the internet to, to exacerbate and accelerate these processes. You know, dealing with hoaxes, again, is not new. There's been a long history of dealing with disinformation and counterinformation in the past. But in the past, the technologies were manageable. Now we are dealing with, with macro-scale technologies on, on, at speeds that cannot be counted. So I, I, I fully sympathize with journalists who feel that you know, even fact-checking is, is difficult. It is difficult. In the 19th century, you could take a week to write a pamphlet. You can't do that now. You need to produce it in five minutes. And the technologies are there, and anyone can use them. I've seen this in the rise of, say, sectarian violence in India, in Burma, in Indonesia. And again, it's always the same culprits involved. It's social media. Um, but. I, I would like to, to throw out here, perhaps for, for discussion later, um, uh, something which, which I think is also interesting, that despite all this, we still have more or less national media. So what's interesting for me now is the rise of things like RT from Russia, Chinese news, and how, to go back to the question earlier about framing and, and about perspective, uh, things are seen differently. That's the one relatively new thing uh, that we find on social media today. On my news feed, I get news from India, I get news from China, that this current dispute or non-dispute along the border, for example, is really interesting to see how the Indian press and the Chinese press report it. Now, the reason why I find that interesting is because that's where alternative vocabularies, ways of describing come in. To go back to the earlier point in the 19th century, it's very interesting to see how the British press reported the quote-unquote Indian mutiny of 1857. At the same time, the American press reported it as the Indian Revolution. <laughs> that word, revolution, is, has an enormous meaning because it, it radically changes how you see the Indian mutiny. So, we are, I think, also now on the verge of having these national medias, of course, with their own biases, with their own agendas, their nationalist agendas, but it does mean that the reader or the news consumer can have access to different ways of looking at the world. It doesn't solve the problem of hoaxes and, and disinformation, but at least to go back to the question of perspective, there is no right perspective, but at least we can, we can see different perspectives. Okay, uh, thanks, Farish. I'm going to say no more questions because 
the clock is ticking over there. But I am going to go to, uh, and ask the speakers one last question. Can, we are mostly practicing journalists here, trying to do a good job in spite of everything that's changing around us. What's the one thing a journalist has to do more of or better today than in the past? Yes, now there is a very important tagline, everybody is a journalist, right? So what kind of journalist? Like us, for example, Alec and me, yeah, we work for more than 10, 30 hours being a journalist. Uh, takes time to become a professional journalist, you know, with the uh, uh, certain procedures. And the most important one is responsibility. As long as you're responsible with the, uh, uh, your publicity, it's okay, as long as you're responsible for that. That's why in Indonesia now, uh, we have a program to do fit and proper test for the journalist. So, uh, the competence test uh, being uh, tested by the press council in Indonesia, this is the independent body, and to show to the people that uh, you can interview by them because it's, it's just a formal and certificate journalist with a certificate with a certain uh, 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 aspect. That's why this is very important uh, in Indonesia. Thank you. Well, thanks. Eric? I would say, well, obviously, accuracy and, and, and fact-checking are essential. Don't, don't, don't rush to, to pick stuff up off social media and, and send them out as fact. But I would say an, an, something that's actually come up and something we discussed in the AFP for the French election was don't, and I see this all the time, and we're, we're, and we're in the middle, we're in the thick of this with Donald Trump, don't get caught up in narratives. Mm -hmm. Journalists love narratives. And, and the story goes in a certain direction, and everything that happens around it feeds into the narrative. And, and with Donald Trump, we're, we're getting this. I mean, whatever you think about Donald Trump, a lot of the stuff is just, it's just sticking to this narrative of, of who he is as a president. And it goes for political stories. It goes for, so don't st step back from narratives. Don't get caught up in a narrative and just, 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 just channel everything you're picking up into, into just keeping this narrative going. You know, you be a, be, play the devil's advocate in your coverage. Step back from it. And if you, if you, if you feel you're sensing you're falling into just, just work, you know, producing your stories around a certain narrative, say, you know, do a bit of self-criticism on it and say, look, look, you know, I've really got a bit more critical about my own reporting on, on this particular story. Great, thank you. Parish, you know journalists well. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't um, presume to, to advise journalists. I think journalists are already doing a, a, a good job and they are facing enormous obstacles. What I would want to say is I would like to address the people in, in IT and, and, and in the communications technology industry, all these social media tools that emerge today. I would like to see responsibility on the part of these innovators and inventors who are inventing these new uh, gadgets and tools and communications platforms when they come up with the next Facebook or the next Twitter or whatever, please understand that in the context of the complex world that we live in today where inequalities still exist, including in inequalities in terms of knowledge and intelligence, you cannot throw a, an app like that into the world assuming that everyone who picks it up will be a rational, sentient human being. And that you must understand that these communicative technologies can be abused. And when they are abused, it's the media that suffers, it's journalism that suffers, it's also academia that suffers because now every student's an expert because you know I just read you know two paragraphs and I'm a, I'm a nuclear physicist or whatever. Lecturers can't even teach it anymore because, because uh, you know, the students are, are, are going on Wikipedia while we are talking. And it, it impacts on governance, it impacts on security. All of this boils down to the one major thing which we've not discussed so far, which is the fourth industrial revolution and the technologies that are actually rendering governance, communication and human contact, meaningful human contact, impossible. So the responsibility for me lies with those in the IT industry and the communications uh, uh, technologies industry, they must understand that the impact of their gadgets uh, are, are far, far wider than they perhaps realize. All right, thank you very much. No, I'm sorry I can't take more questions, but the speakers, uh, Farish has to leave, but Eric and Wayu will be around. Uh, catch them during the break or later in the day or save your question for the, the, the other panels that are coming up after this. So can you join me in thanking our speakers today?
Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's see you again. Like,